on behalf of um, the ILA board, the International Light Association board, um, and the president, Thelma Vanderwerf, uh, we are very happy to welcome you um, for the inaugural ILA talk show. Uh, the International Light Association is an international body of volunteers and practitioners that focus on utilizing light, sound, and color for health and well being. Today, we have a fantastic lineup of speakers for our inaugural show. Um, and uh, the first guest is uh, Anadi Martel of uh, Sensora, Sensatech um, um, fame. Uh, he's also the author of uh, a benchmark book in a profession called Light Therapies and uh, a past president of the ILA for seven years uh, from 2011 to 2018. For, uh, and we're very thankful for his uh, service to, uh, in getting the ILA to the point where it is now. Um, the second speaker is Dr. Jacob Lieberman. Uh, he will come, um, he, will, uh, he will be live at about uh, 12.45. And the format that we are following, um, I will do a, a bigger introduction to him uh, when he comes on. The format we are following is um, that uh, our guest would uh, share uh, their work on the topic that's, uh, um, that's been highlighted uh, in the, in the newsletters and in the mailers that you got. And then at the end, we would have a Q and A, a question and answer session. After that, we will go to Jacob. And again, he would speak for about 25 to 30 minutes. And then we would have a Q and A uh, session at the end. You're welcome to uh, post the questions in the chat. Um, and, um, we will try to get to all of them uh, before we close out at about 1.30 p.m. New York time. So um, please join me in welcoming uh, Anadi Martel. Anadi, thank you for taking the time. We are very happy to host you. And we look forward to your talk on color therapy. So over to you, Anadi. Thank you very much, Abay. It's a great pleasure to be invited. And wonderful to see all of you even if it's uh, <laughs> at a distance and in, in tiny little pictures but it's wonderful to connect uh, in this way so uh, great that you've taken this initiative to uh, organize these talk shows i would love to pose a question before you start the slides sure. for me right um you you have done such such groundbreaking work on you know how you develop the sensora and the sensor tech right it's obviously connected all to color therapy. So maybe a good idea to just give us a little background on how you um, got to this point. You know, I know you're a physicist, you've worked on it for 30 years um, and you have had great international exposure set. So a little bit of background on who you are and how your journey has been before the slide. So uh, we can know a little more about you. Okay, well, um, as you mentioned, my, my training is as a physicist in Canada here. And, um, but from an early age, I was interested in meditation. So I ended up uh, spending a few years in India exploring meditation and, and discovering the whole dimension of, uh, of consciousness, uh, which um, was a re revelation for me. Um, well, ever since then, I've been trying to, to uh, bridge these two dimensions of science and uh, the consciousness and it, it's it's an infinite field of work it's ongoing and uh, we need a lot of people on the planet to to uh, explore that uh, that merging because it's really key to our future and you started sensora uh in the you started work on it with ma primo your partner in the 90s right almost 30 years ago in the 80s in the 80s no kidding <laughs> yes <laughs> that's an old story yeah, it's been ongoing um, all the while, and I keep on refining the, the technology, exploring, uh, bringing up new generations of, of uh, ways to, to work with light. So it's, um, and it's, it's not ended yet. 
That's great. I hope I hope it continues oh. many more decades because your contributions have been stellar. So for those of you um, who know Anadi, um, I have met him before, uh, you know his contributions to the ILA. But for me personally, the reason that I became interested in the ILA is because I was speaking at a conference that he was speaking at and I saw his presentation and I was blown away. You know, I was like, wait, there's a group that does this already and I don't have to like keep grappling for information. And uh, then, you know, of course we were in touch and then I attended the future conferences and here we are six years later, um, you know, hosting you um, to share your knowledge and wisdom about what you've been doing for uh, over three decades. So um, stage is yours, uh, Nadi. Again, welcome and thank you for being here. Great. Um, well, the, the topic that I proposed today was, um, I call it the, the scientific basis of color therapy, which is a bit ambitious. The, um, maybe we can start with the slides, uh, Justin. We all know that um, there is a, a renaissance of light medicine uh, since uh, the past 20 years or so. And um, light medicine has moved on from being a, a paria, a quark thing to an officially recognized discipline in, the, in the, that time, in this past 20 years. And uh, so there is now a body of uh, um, scientific evidence for light medicine that's constantly growing. And of course, for all of us who've been working with light uh, since uh, long before that, um, this is a very uh, wonderful development. It, it kind of validates much of what we've been saying all along. Um, the, but there is still some, a bit of confusion I often see regarding this because uh, you, you, you might want to use this uh, scientific evidence that we have for light medicine uh, and apply it directly to what we do and say, look, here's the proof that it works. It's all uh, uh, established and so on. And what I want to, to clarify maybe today is which parts actually are scientifically validated by this revolution that's happening now and which part are still uh, beyond it. Um, because it's very important in our work to, to have that clarity and um, so that, that's what I want to try to, to go through today. Um, the um, scientific discoveries that, that are um, really um, um, moving light medicine ahead uh, now are, uh, I mentioned them here, photobiomodulation, the, the cellular effects of light on, um, to, to accelerate cellular metabolism. Um, and that's a very powerful mechanism that has uh, great deep uh, ramifications. And the second big topic being explored by light medicine is the non-visual optic pathway and the, the whole topic of circadian lighting and how light is key in, in maintaining our inner balance, our inner rhythms and our hormonal balance. So there's a lot of uh, exploration uh, going on these things. Um, Justin, you want to go to the next slide? So let's look at um, how this lab medicine uses colors, uh, because we're talking about color therapy here, uh, um, mostly. Uh, and of course, there is light and colors are uh, completely uh, um, uh, merged. They go together. You don't have one without the other. Uh, so Let's look at how this use of colors is scientifically validated, which part of it is really uh, within the, the domain of light medicine. Uh, so we, we just go through the colors, uh, the main colors one by one and see how they're, they're used. Of course, red is the color of photobiomodulation. It's the part of the spectrum which is most active for this uh, uh, mitochondrial ATP uh, stimulation. So it's being used in medicine now a lot uh, if you look on the web, you have an infinite number of, of products working with this red light. Uh, so it, it, it's um, a key to the, the light medicine process now. The next slide. Yellow is starting to be used in, uh, in skincare. You see it in beauty salons and so on, in many uh, commercial uh, applications. 
to help with skin tone and, and uh, wrinkles and so on. Next slide. Green is uh, an interesting case. There's some uh, studies going on at the University of Arizona uh, showing how uh, green light is very effective to treat uh, uh, chronic pain and migraine also. Um, and actually, the, the researchers doing that work had a bit of problem to explain this, this effect of green within the framework of light medicine, because it is kind of encroaching into color therapy. And they're not so um, familiar with it. They don't have as much ground to stand on with this. So it's interesting to see how, because the research is happening within an academic uh, framework, university, um, it, it brings validity to, to um, the use of, of colors in this way. Um, whereas uh, they still don't have a theoretical framework to, to kind of uh, understand properly and what's going on here, they can just um, um, see the effects and, and see what, uh, that it, it's really doing something. We move on to the next color. We have um, blue. Uh, blue is a key color. We, uh, there's a lot of talk about it in light medicine. It was originally used uh, to treat neonatal jaundice in, in decades uh, because it, it converts really rubin uh, in the blood of infants. Um, and more recently, all the, the talk about the non-visual optic effects, uh, the influence on the hormonal balance, the, the suprachiasmatic nucleus, the hypothalamus, and this is all centered around the blue part of the spectrum. So a key color there that's uh, very important in our modern world. The next slide. The Violet, we're starting to see some uses of violet, uh, mostly for sterilization and, and uh, because violet photons have the most energy, they, they have the most impact uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, oxidization of cells. Um, and so you're starting to see various applications now using violet light. Um, and, and even as part of lighting, they, they, they're talking of integrating violet into a regular um, luminaires to kind of sterilize on a continuous basis uh, uh, clinical settings. And the next slide. Ultraviolet is, there's a lot of talk about it these days because of COVID. The, it, it's um, a superb way of uh, sterilizing uh, COVID uh, virus. Uh, and uh, again, there's talk of using it more and more uh, in, in public areas, in hospitals, in planes. Uh, so it, it's a very dynamic field currently. Naturally, UVB is essential for vitamin D uh, generation synthesis. Um, okay, so the next slide. So we've just seen how colors are used in light medicine. That there's, so you might think that, uh, okay, uh, now we have it. Um, light medicine has understood the effects of color. And indeed, uh, um, light medicine is now uh, um, pursued by thousands of researchers around the planet. It's, it's a very large uh, undertaking, and it's, uh, it's really fascinating to see how it's uh, quickly it's expanded. Uh, you have hundreds of studies coming out every year. You have uh, numerous uh, international conferences on laser medicine. So it, it's an extremely, uh, it it's rests on very solid scientific ground, the whole field of light medicine now. So it's a wonderful basis for us. Next slide. But is this really all there is to color therapy as we understand it? And in fact, no. That, and, and that's the, the, really the crux of what I want to talk about here. All these applications of um, these forms of light therapy that we've just uh, looked at now actually um, don't depend so much on, on color. They all talk about specific biomolecular phenomena uh, that are driven by light. Uh, and of course, that have a certain action spectrum. They, they will respond to some part of the spectrum more than others. And in that sense, they are dependent on color. But when you apply color to, to these uh, uh, phenomena, you don't in no way change the quality of them. You just change the intensity of the stimulus for that particular biochemical uh, reaction. 
whether it's photobiomodulation or, or melatonin suppression and so on and, and so on. So you, you, this is not what we're talking about when we talk about color therapy or chromotherapy. Um, in chromotherapy, you expect different colors to have different effects. You have qualitatively distinct effects of colors. And usually in chromotherapy systems, you have a balance between these different colors. They all work uh, uh, synergistically uh, to create a whole uh, um, dimension of healing. So it's very different from, uh, um, you don't have the, this polarity phenomenon uh, in regular light medicine, um, light therapy, as it is understood medically that you see in the forms of chromotherapy that are being used. And just to illustrate that, you can move on to the next slide. I'm showing you some of the uh, um, color wheels that are being used in, in color therapy and chromotherapy. Uh, the, the most fundamental one is the one created by Dinsha, dating back to the 1920s. So you see here the whole spectrum of colors arranged in, in the wheel. And um, uh, already from the time of Dinsha and, and before and since then, chromotherapists uh, know very well that when you use complementary colors, you have complementary effects. So it's important to see how you arrange these colors and these, these wheel um, formations to see where you get complementaries, where if you go across the axis, you get opposite colors and you expect uh, uh, oppo opposing effects from these uh, along these axes. And different color systems uh, will use different types of color wheels. Uh, so I'm going to show you a few of them just, just for your enjoyment. Uh, the next slide uh, just shows us uh, uh, dear old Din Shah here uh, and his spectrocom device from 1925 is really the ancestor of what we're working with today. And of course, Din Shah is, is, um, um, is an example of, of and um, how um, people who worked with this type of thing have been um, pursued by, by medicine over most of the 20th century. As you well know, his work was suppressed, and even today, he's still, his work is still not legal. Um, next slide. Hey, just very quickly, Anadi. Uh, mm -hmm. Isn't it true that Dinsha was actually sent to prison and persecuted for, and is all his... Uh, laboratory uh, research papers, everything was kind of burned by the FDA here in the United right. States. Yeah. I, yeah, I read yeah. The, yeah oh. Two um, court cases, the one in the 30s, which he won. And then they succeeded in having another one in, in I think, the 40s or 50s. And this one he lost. And um, so it's, it, indeed, his, his whole work was uh, uh, destroyed. His laboratory was destroyed, his, his papers. I think only one copy survived, but, um, which we still have today. Uh, and even today, the, the injunction that was imposed by the FDA and his work remains valid. So his son, um, um, Harry Dinsha, who is uh, pursuing his father's work, still has a severely limited in what he can do legally. So yes, indeed, it, it, it's an interesting example. And he's still considered uh, um, uh, ridiculed. Uh, if you look at the web, it is, it is, um, there's not much respect for his work in the scientific community. And um, we try to understand a, a bit better why that is in the next minute. Um, here, I'm just going to show you quickly some of the other color wheels that have existed in history. The, uh, one of the original ones is from uh, Newton himself in uh, the, the 1660s. He already had, had this concept of putting colors together from the rainbow. Um, next slide. A famous one is the one from Goethe from the 1800s. Again, he started to organize colors and to give them properties and, and qualities. Next one. Here we have uh, uh, Theo Gimbels, another pioneer in the 70s. His circle was based on eight different colors. It was an octagon with, again, different qualities and different polarities of colors within that. Next one. A more bonded one is uh, the color wheel, uh, the harmonic chromatic wheel of Pierre Van Obergen, a colleague from the ILA, whom we well know. Um, he again has a different organization, more based on the red, green, and blue uh, to match our visual system. 
mm -hmm. as primary colors. Um, so it just gives you an idea. All these systems have led to uh, uh, different generations of instruments and uh, chromotherapy modalities. Mm -hmm. Again, I'll just go briefly to a few of them, a few of uh, the most modern ones. Um, one is uh, there's a whole range of instruments based on syntonic optometry, the work of Spittler dating back from the 20s. And uh, you had instruments in the 80s from John Downing. You have uh, uh, the, our um, Leona's uh, creation, the photon wave still being produced today. Next slide. Um, you have different types of color toning systems where you project colors on the skin, like Dinsha was doing. And modern variations of that include uh, the Lumicure sy system from Pierre Van Obergen. Again, sophisticated computer driven uh, um, light generating devices, color generating devices. Next one. Um, you have a whole range of um, interconnection between colors and acupuncture, traditional uh, Chinese medicine, uh, which have given rise to very sophisticated chromotherapy modalities. Uh, for example, um, uh, color puncture from Peter Mandel. Uh, is one of the most famous ones. We have chromatotherapy from Dr. Agrappa. Again, these are people whom we've seen at the ILA at various conferences in the past. We have a less known system of photonomedicine by Pierre Magnin, which uh, died uh, just uh, a couple of months ago, and which we've honored at the ILA uh, by giving him the uh, Francis McManaman Award because his work really deserves to be better known. Uh, again, he was applying colors. Uh, one aspect of his work was applying colors on reflex points, uh, mostly on the ear, the auricular therapy, Noji's work. So these are all very sophisticated systems uh, applying colors uh, on uh, the body, on, on reflex points, uh, and meridians, acupuncture points, and so on. Next slide. Um, you have the work of uh, Karl Ryberg, monochrome uh, systems uh, using monochromatic light, very pure, narrow bandwidth sources of light, which have great, uh, which have the highest potential, both uh, in psychological and, and biological terms. Uh, so again, he, he's, he's working now on the next generation of the devices. So this is uh, uh, still in full development. Yeah. Next slide. You have um, the Sensora, which is my own creation and my own work, uh, using uh, uh, multi-sensorial stimulation, combining light with sound and kinesthetic um, um, transduction. So um, again, the expression of using modern technology uh, to apply uh, these properties of colors. Next slide. So you can see this whole range of color instruments are quite distinct from what's happening in mainstream light medicine. Uh, and why is that? How can we understand these scientific and uh, scientific terms, the, these various instruments that work with the properties of pure colors and the interplay of different colors? Um, the trouble is that if you try to do it in purely biomolecular terms, it has like medicine is doing, you quickly run into problems. Um, I, I've seen some people are trying, for example, to uh, simply um, find out different chromophores in the body, uh, light sensitive uh, uh, proteins. Um, and from those, try to understand how all these colors would have an effect. On, on cells, and, and if you do that, you will never be able to, to get the full power of uh, what we see in those chromotherapy systems. It, it just doesn't explain the whole thing at all. And um, other people I've seen are trying just to decompose these different colors into the red, green, and blue primary components and see the proportions of those. And maybe from that, they could explain the effects of colors, and again, uh, if you do that, you will never uh, see the full uh, uh, potential of um, the systems that we're talking about. So something else must be at play. And um, there's a couple of things that, uh, that uh, we can look into. One is the whole field of energy medicine. Uh, maybe here, 
And I think, yeah, uh, next slide, I just see. Yeah, so you can just um, zoom back here to me. Um, so energy medicine, what is that? Uh, it, it's understanding life in terms of uh, energy fields rather than understanding in terms of, of molecules of, uh, as medicine is doing. And um, medicine is starting to go in that direction, but it's, we're really still in the very, very early days of that new uh, type of, of medicine. And um, there has been research going on for it for decades. It goes back to quite a, a while back. And there's been major scientists uh, devoting their life to it. So it's not like it's something that doesn't exist and that's not scientifically valid. The point is just that it's a new science that that's, is still being born. We're still talking about things that are not fully understood, new phenomena of life. So it's not surprising that it, it cannot fit uh, nice, nicely and easily within the framework of uh, regular medicine and, and uh, biology. A good reference uh, um, in terms of uh, energy medicine, if you're interested in the topic, next mm -hmm. slide, will, is of course the work of James Oshman. We've invited many times uh, James at, at um, conferences and um, his, his reference book is excellent if you want to understand more what's happening in that field. Mm -hmm. Complete basis of energy medicine. Next slide. And um, what, he, what he explains is that there is in the body a whole range of connective tissues that are actually li liquid crystalline, liquid crystals. And they, they, this whole new research is indicating that you can actually have fields, various types of fields uh, propagating through this whole network within our body. And that opens the door to understand things like uh, these uh, ways of, for example, using light and acupuncture points, because th these uh, energetic pathways within the body can conduct uh, um, energy fields, including light. So it, it's a whole new way to approach this thing and, and understand what might be going on. Next slide. Um, and so how would light interact with, with these uh, networks uh, within the body? Uh, naturally, light is a wave. That's the basic uh, property. And wave means it has frequency. So now we run into the whole field of frequency and vibration uh, um, interaction and, and vibration medicine. Next slide. Um, how can we interact with these waves? Well, through resonance, the universal phenomenon of resonance. Um, whenever you have something vibrating, uh, if you expose it to something vibrating at a similar frequency, they will fall in sync, they will resonate, and there will be an extremely efficient energy transfer when you are at the same frequency. So it's the basis of, of uh, lots of, of fundamental phenomena. Next slide. Um, it's very beautiful to see this at work in cymatics, the works of Hans Jenny, um, where you kind of visualize how these uh, resonances transform uh, uh, matter and from few very basic components, few very basic sine waves, uh, uh, frequencies. Uh, if you vibrate, in, in this case, it's a little plate of water, you see extremely complex, uh, exquisite shapes taking form. Uh, next slide, we see it live on video. Um, some examples of cymatic patterns uh, created by uh, Gary Buchanan, who unfortunately died uh, last year. Again, we had him at the ILA and, and he um, showed us, he, he created, explored many of these beautiful resonance patterns. Here you see just, you change frequencies a bit and you create completely different uh, um, patterns within matter. So this is just to illustrate how simple vibrations can have this deep impact uh, within, uh, within us in terms of energy fields. Next slide. Um, and of course, there's, um, you can also talk about modulating light. Light is a perfect uh, medium to, to apply modulation, to change its intensity or its color um, at lower frequencies. And then you enter the whole world of uh, um, vibration healing systems. Uh, and there are many going around many frequency systems that you can explore. Most of them are empirical. Not many are based on, on uh, uh, 
uh, clear scientific uh, foundations, but they, they work. So they, they definitely they, they are undercovering something that we need to understand better. And there's a whole field of audiovisual stimulation where you use uh, uh, low frequency uh, oscillations to interact with biorhythms such as brain waves. Uh, and that field has a good clinical validation. There's a lot of work and studies going on. Um, so energy medicine, this whole world that has to be understood uh, before uh, the, the real uh, most deep effects of colors uh, will be revealed. So there is a lot of work still left to be done. And it, there's a second layer uh, to be understood, and that's the, the fact that light also works on um, our mind. It doesn't only work on our body and our energy. And that opens up a whole other range of um, chromotherapy work. Lots of color therapies work at that level, at the work of interacting with mind, with cognition, and with consciousness. Light is our main sensorial influence through vision. So it's not surprising that it has such a profound effect on cognition. Next. Uh, we can see easily our light reaches many, many different reaches of the brain. First, of course, through the optic nerve, um, going to the visual cortex, and from there diffusing to all other parts of the brain. Next slide. There are others. Um, optic uh, pathways, which are significant, the retinopectal, the accessory optic pathways, which again link the retina to other parts of the brain, to the brainstem, to the amygdala, the seat of emotions. Um, this, uh, and basically, next slide, all areas of the brain are connected to vision and to light. So it's, it's very obvious that light and colors uh, will have a deep impact at many, many levels on the brain and cognition. And all these pathways I just mentioned, by the way, are, are fully um, transmit, transmitting color information. They don't simply transmit intensity information like the uh, non-visual optic pathway, the, the hypothalamic uh, pathway does. They actually transmit the full uh, RGB information of color. So they expose all these regions to the brain to color influences. Next slide. And um, when we understand how um, the mind has a basic influence over the body through all these uh, modalities that I list here, things like the placebo effect, epigenetics, neuroplasticity, psychoneuroimmunology, all these fields which show how the way in which you think and the, your mind frame really controls your health and, and, and your body, and then again, it's easy to understand how light and colors can start to have this deep influence on health because light and colors, uh, um, uh, when we perceive them consciously, uh, have uh, uh, this powerful effect on our mind. So it opens the, the door to all kinds, a whole range of subjective effects of colors because each of us will perceive colors in its own way. And this is another area which uh, makes it very difficult quantify a lot of the, um, what chromotherapy does because a lot of it is subjective. It will, it's very difficult to identify uh, clear-cut effects of colors because they depend on, on different people. So you, you, that's where things like color tests become useful to understand better the color profile, the color receptivity of people and adapting the way you will use colors on these people. Again, this is falling outside of, of light medicine as such. Um, but there are beautiful uh, um, systems like Pierre Van Obergen's color test or the Lucia test, which um, allow such things. Um, next slide. Nadi, we should uh, try to wrap it up in the next two minutes so we have time for questions. Uh, there are yes, and uh, uh, <laughs> to remind that, but that's actually just what's happening is we have a minute left. Um, so beyond that, that uh, psychological effect of colors, which opens the, opens the door to psychotherapy treatments, uh, there's a whole even deeper layer of uh, interaction between light and consciousness itself. And I'm just touching uh, to that uh, to end here. But the deepest influence of colors may be entirely non-material. 
um, related to the nature of consciousness itself. We, we all know that there is this thing between consciousness and light. It's uh, the highest forms of consciousness are called enlightenment. So it, it's very clear and last line. And um, it's also under important to understand that science doesn't know anything about consciousness. Uh, you, you shouldn't be fooled into thinking that it's fallen within the realm of science. Uh, absolutely not. Uh, there is a whole field of uh, neuropsychology and, and, and science exploring consciousness, but what they are looking into is rather the, the part that's uh, mind or intelligence or, or thought processes but not consciousness itself. They still have not, many have still not fully understood the distinction between uh, mind, thought, and consciousness, the substrate into which these uh, thoughts are happening. So it, it's another layer that is still falling outside of science. So that's it for me. And this is just to show you how we still have quite some way to go before color therapy, chromotherapy can be integrated into a fully scientific framework yeah. and in a way it's a good thing because it, it we're touching things that go beyond current science but that are also rooted in current science so so this is uh, one way to to see this if you want to to know more about all these things uh, of course uh, I, I talk about them in my book life therapies so that's it for the slides uh, justin you can come back to us fantastic thank you anali that was very informative as always and the book is available on Amazon, right? Or they have to order it directly from you? No, they get it from Amazon, I don't sell it. Okay, fantastic. So uh, it's on Amazon, it's a fantastic book. Um, it's a great gift also for anybody who is in the field and who doesn't have the book. So I would strongly recommend it. Um, um, I've really enjoyed reading it and uh, learning about, uh, you know, how this profession or this focus specialization has evolved. So that brings me to, there's, there are a few questions that uh, have come in. And one of them is, uh, well, two more questions, okay. Um, and another question. So there are a few questions coming in, but we have only five minutes. Uh, so um, the one question that came in first was, um, which is connected to a question I wanted to ask you, which is uh, in the evolutionary steps you know, for color therapy, what do you foresee? Because uh, as was pointed out by one of the guests is that the things that have happened to Dinshaw, Tesla and Wilhelm Reich have the same signature. You know, the, I remember that uh, I heard Dietrich Klinghardt speak in Vienna and he says that unless you're on the, was it him or somebody else who said, if you're not on the quack, uh, quack watch, then you haven't done anything useful. And uh, I just wanted to know for those of us who are, uh, learning from stalwarts like you, what do you think is the future of uh, color therapy? And, um, you know, how do we mainstream it? Well, I like a lot um, James Oshman's um, take on that, uh, mm -hmm. where he says that it's just a matter of time before energy medicine takes over. It's the medicine of the 21st century. It is going that way. It's, it's regularly expanding. Uh, we, there's more and more talk about uh, using frequencies, even in medicine itself. So it is happening at its own pace. It's very slow because medicine is an enormous system. It's one of the biggest establishments on the planet. Uh, trillions of dollars at play. It cannot move uh, quickly. So it's kind of natural that it takes its time, uh, but it, it, it is happening. Uh, the movement is un unstoppable. And um, so I would say for us, um, while the, the science is catching up, um, the best we can do is to try to, to at least uh, provide clinical validation to what we're doing. Even if we cannot uh, explain in, in fundamental terms how it works, mm. uh, we can at least demonstrate that it does work. And so clinical studies, case studies are, are really a key to, to try to uh, bring forward uh, the cause. and, and I'm working on some, some clinical studies with the sensora and sensor sphere. So I think within our possibilities, one thing that we, we can strive for. That's fantastic. Yeah, that's fantastic. I think that's that's really, uh, you're right. It's, uh, it's I think what Jim Oshman has said is um, that it is going to get there. 
um, can we be catalysts to speed it up is, um, is a very good question. And I think what you said about the scientific clinical data to back it up uh, is critical. Then of course, the big real life question is funding for those kind of research yeah. topics, but I'm yeah. sure you're familiar with that. So. It is indeed, it's not easy. <laughs> But so, you have academics more and more who are open or I mean, light because of the, the light medicine uh, renaissance suddenly is an in topic. Everybody's curious about light, which wasn't yeah. the case 10 years ago. So it, right. you find actually it is easier now to, to get interest, to, to get uh, like one study we're doing now in France is with the team of, of doctors in a hospital. And they are open. They're very open. To it. Fantastic. Fantastic. And in fact, our next speaker, Jacob, um, wrote, that benchmark book in, uh, I think it was late 80s, early 90s, uh, Light as a Medicine of the Future. Um, so it's fantastic that he's gonna be speaking right after you. And then interestingly, the next talk, just jumping ahead in two weeks, we have two doctors. One is Dr. Larry Wallace, who's gonna speak about uh, ocular phototherapy and syntonics. And then we have Dr. Mark Ray from the Lighting Research Center who's gonna speak about uh, circadian rhythms and how uh, blue uh, light impacts it. So it's gonna be an interesting dialogue uh, for the next talk as well. But coming back to questions for you, uh, many, many uh, kudos and accolades uh, coming your way from um, in, in the chat. Uh, but one, the two questions, one is uh, uh, in my clinic, it seems most of the children like the green color most. And for grown-ups, they feel a deep calmness by the deep magenta color. Can you explain why? And then um, the next uh, question, which I would love for you to end with, is how do you perceive uh, consciousness and where is intuition in this? So maybe the green and the magenta question first and then uh, uh, close with... Uh, the last one. Well, it's an interesting experience that, that these two colors come up for, for that um, that person. Uh, I don't know if it, it can be generalized. Uh, I mean, if you do lots of color tests, you see quite a big variation. Um, so maybe it's just a, a kind of a coincidence that these clusters that happen there, I don't know. Um, but um, of course, um, Magenta is part of the balance. They're both balancing colors. So you could expect that people are looking for balance. They, they don't want the extreme of uh, too low energy with uh, relaxing blue or too, too much stress with stimulating red. So you can imagine that that's, that's where the, the resting point, the consensus, consensus uh, lies. Yeah. And your second question, I couldn't um, understand. Uh, the question is, uh -huh, consciousness uh, and intuition. <laughs> well, we we resolve that. Have, to be the too much time. I'll take a few days, seconds. but yeah. <laughs> but maybe like yeah. sixty seconds or less, if you could. Right, right. <laughs> I mean, this is an infinite topic. Um, that True. Is really, uh, but I, I guess what I the point I wanted to make is is to to remain open to the fact that when you work with light and colors. You work, of course, with with very physical phenomenon, energies, and it's it's totally uh, real and physical. But you also work with something that is transcendental, that that can connect you with with dimensions beyond the mind, uh, dimensions of consciousness, and and that lead to breakthroughs for people, uh, deep breakthroughs uh, and uh, openings. So it, it's it's always nice to to be reminded of of those. The whole the full spectrum the light has so many um, different modalities and aspects. Right, right. Well, thank you, thank you for attempting uh, that short answer for a big question, and thank you for all your answers. Um, uh, really inspiring and evocative. Uh, and Anadi, again, I know you're busy, so thank you for your time. And it's been a pleasure. Looking forward to see Jacob now. Yep, yep. And before we go to Jacob, um, we have uh, a video a message from our uh, uh, the ILA president, uh, Talma Van der Wolf. Um, and we're going to show that now and then, uh, um, you know, welcome Jacob right after that. So uh, Great, we're very grateful that, that Talma has uh, stepped in to, uh, 
Yes, we are all very Vice President leadership. Yes. Welcome to the talk show of the International Light Association. We meet twice a month live on alternate Wednesdays. And if you miss a live event, you can see the recordings of the shows on the ELA YouTube channel. We are excited to present to you experts in the field of light, color and sound and how these energies or frequencies can be applied to advance health and well-being. In this talk show, you learn interesting facts from experts around the world and you will not only be able to listen to the presentations and debates, but you will also be able to ask these experts your questions. The ELA invites you to join us on this journey of learning and exploring the vast possibilities to use light, color and sound for your well-being. Thank you, Thelma. Um, what a fantastic message. Um, and yes, it's been, uh, since a new board has come in, it's been very exciting to get everything started. So thank you and thank you, Nadi, again. Um, and on that note, I would like to welcome Jacob Lieberman. Uh, he's currently in Hawaii at his uh, residence there. Um, um, can we add Jacob, uh, Justin? For many of you, Jacob needs no introduction. Um, I had the pleasure of uh, meeting him uh, for the first time in Vienna, where I was um, blown away by uh, how, how beautiful of a human being he was. Um, from a personal standpoint, I thought he, the way he presented his knowledge in his humble, uh, laid back manner, uh, just kept ringing bells for me because I really enjoyed not just his content, not just his knowledge, but how he delivered it and his empathy and how much he cared uh, you know, for the person he was talking to. Since then, I've had the pleasure to host him at different venues. Uh, um, and every time he's been uh, uh, so well received that, uh, you know, we can't just help it, but invite him every time we do something new, um, you know. And um, he is uh, a well-renowned author of several books. The latest one was Luminous Life. But as I mentioned earlier, uh, he's also the author of the benchmark book called Light as the Medicine of the Future. Uh, he's written several other books, um, Take Off Your Glasses and See, you know, uh, Wisdom from an Empty Mind, just fantastic books uh, um, for, for reference and self-improvement. Today, we have invited him uh, to talk about seeing beyond 2020. Right, and uh, the audience has uh, sent questions to him um, before uh, before uh, today. Um, so it, it's really going to be um, him responding to the questions that have come and, and uh, sharing his thoughts and wisdom with us. Welcome, Jacob. It's good to see you. Abe, it's wonderful to be here, and uh, I couldn't think of. Uh a sweeter, more knowledgeable human being um, to warm things up than Anadi Martel. So uh, I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Fantastic. So many things were mentioned today when Anadi began speaking. He spoke about uh, spending some time in India and um, investigating the field of meditation. And he sort of began by stating quite clearly that it is in this invisible realm uh, where truth lies, mm -hmm. where that which we haven't come to yet. Interestingly for me, um, two of my mentors who I had very personal connections with uh, were John Ott and Fritz Holvich. One who 
was a lay person that brought to the world an understanding <clears throat> that light was critical to every aspect of health. That was John Ott. And Fritz Holvich, who in 1947, the year of my birth, um, made a statement that the stimulatory and regulatory effect of light on the human body occurs by way of the eyes. And so it was some of his groundbreaking work that described what then became called the retinohypothalamic pathway or what Anadi spoke of as the non-optic or non-visual pathway that impacts hormones and general physiological balance. Anadi mentioned about the color wheel and the work of Dinshaw and the many iterations of that wheel uh, from Dinshaw to Gimbel, Newton, Goethe, and so on. It's interesting that when I got introduced to syntonics in the 70s, I discovered something very interesting. Uh, of course, Dinshaw's work I was already aware of and the color wheel, <clears throat> but the, the originator of syntonics also had an almost identical color wheel, uh, Harry Riley Spittler and another one of his colleagues, Carl Loeb also had an almost identical color wheel. The colors had different notations. Some were colors, some were Greek symbols, but they were describing the same thing, Dinshaw via the body um, and Spittler via the eyes. <clears throat> the one thing that became very evident to me in the very late 70s after going through a, a very difficult uh, period of time in my life, uh, where my life um, allowed me to directly experience something about the science of life, something that occurs in our everyday existence <clears throat> that is a science that we don't typically look at, which is how does our life actually work? Because that's a reflection of how everything else is working within us. And so my, my approach to utilizing different portions of the visible spectrum after uh, the foundation that I received from syntonics was based on what I learned through direct experience about how we resonated with certain parts of our life and didn't resonate to the same degree with others and how that manifested in our life. And then I found a direct reflection of that in our interactions with what we call color or different portions of the light spectrum. And I discovered early on that our relationship to the different portions of the light spectrum was a reflection of our relationship with the different portions of the life spectrum. So you could say light is the formless and life is the form, which puts light in a very special light in that it both has uh, what we think of as a material effect, but also a non-material effect. And this is represented in so many ways that we look at light. If you look at biblically in the beginning, it says, let there be light. And then it said, God created the sun, moon, and the stars on the fourth day. It speaks to two qualities of light. One, which is a quality of creation. And the other one, which is something that we experience in our everyday existence. What we know from all of the work that has been done to date about light is that our every physiological function is light 
dependent. In fact, the Nobel Prize in 2017 on medicine or physiology was won by three US scientists that basically discovered the molecular basis by which our cells are continually rebalancing themselves and synchronizing themselves with mother nature based on how they are impacted by light, darkness, spectral characteristics throughout the 24 hour cycle not just when we awaken and when we go to sleep, but everything else that's going on in between via stimulation from sun by day and through moon and stars by night. So on one level, you look at the impact of light and you say that light is designed to balance us and to bring us into a state of health and wellness. As I said in Light Medicine of the Future, the purpose of life, of light, was to help guide us into a state of oneness with life. In other words, the purpose of light was to awaken us into a state of illumination or enlightenment. And that's essentially what my life's journey has been about and what my work has continually evolved into both in terms of light and in terms of vision and their inseparability from what we call consciousness. So the question is, what does it mean to see beyond 2020? And what does that title have anything to do with what I just said? I find it interesting that a common expression that we use these days is hindsight is 2020. When we look back after the fact, then we see it clearly. That's another way of saying that we don't see it clearly when it's actually happening. The question is, why is that? Mm. And if you look at what's going on in the world right now, from an out of control pandemic to what's occurring within the US and many other countries in terms of a living expression of duality of one or the other without the middle. And so when you look at what's happening in the world right now, and you combine that with the fact that even though science has taken us so far, we still have more people getting sick than we've ever had before. We have more cancer, more heart disease, more more diabetes, more obesity, more COVID. So then the question is, seeing. It's all about not hindsight being 2020, but it's about our ability to see what's happening right now. And so the question is, how is that related to all of these things? Because I know that light is the medicine, not of the future anymore, of the now. The question is, how can it have that impact versus just an impact of utilizing it for symptomatic relief? And so my journey has really been about that deeper place and wondering why light is referred to as consciousness, why, while the concept of God is referred to as consciousness, while, why light is the foundation of quantum mechanics. So it's all about seeing. And in order to see clearly It's not about doing something. 
but it's about noticing how our conditioning of doing and seeing through the mind actually obscures truth. The truth that has the potential to set us free and to allow us to live at our maximum potential, both in terms of health, but perhaps even more importantly, in terms of contentment. So how do we start to access that? Being trained uh, as an optometrist and vision scientist, I was led to believe that we see with our, our eyes. And so I spent much time uh, studying the anatomy and physiology of the eye. And I realized that if you believe or if you see vision as occurring in the eye, then vision will be restricted by what's happening in the eye. I then learned of something called mind. I remember studying something called Silva mind control in the very early 70s. And they had this statement they made. The mind selects, the brain records, the body enacts. And so I began realizing that the content of the mind was influencing the way we saw. I then had this profound experience in 1976 where my eyesight after wearing glasses for many years instantaneously cleared. And it occurred without any changes to the eye. And so here I had a direct experience that the source of the seeing was not the eye. It was involved the eye, but it also involved other things. And at that time in 1976, I was sure that it was the mind, whatever the mind was. And the way I spoke about it, because I did a four-year experiment, which I called an experiment on the workings of my mind between 1976 and 1981. And the way I used to speak about it was if I can just find the right button to press, I could see what actually occurred. And then I could share this with people because I knew something had happened that was very, very powerful. And I knew that part of my, my life's journey was to try to see if I could share this and what it, to make a contribution to humanity. That was part of the reason I left the optometric field in the mid eighties, the discoveries about light, the discoveries about vision and the discoveries about how to learn without effort or maybe what I eventually came to see is how to live with minimal effort. After 44 years of seeing clearly without glasses and still my eyes, they used to be nearsighted with a significant amount of astigmatism. Now they're farsighted to the same degree with even more astigmatism but I still see clearly. So my journey has been all about what is the source of the seeing? And, and Anadi spelled it out so beautifully. We have no sense of what consciousness is. We think of consciousness as the mind or what we experience as the conscious mind, the ego, local consciousness, if you will. What we experience as mind 
is like a film strip in a projector. A film tells a story. Uh, so when you sit in the movie theater, you look at a screen, it's perfectly white, and then all of a sudden, life is projected on that screen. And with the very large screens, the hemispheric screens they have these days and the surround sound and the holophonic sound, you're in it. It's reality. And you feel all the impacts of what's happening on the screen. If you look behind you, you see a projector. And that projector is a source of light with a film strip. And so the purity of the light is modified by the context, the content of the film strip. And so that example allowed me to, to see that the contents of the mind is really a recording of the conditioning throughout humanity. It's really a historical recording imprint of all the things that have been conditioned, not only into me from the time of my birth, but my mother, my father, their mother, their father, their mother is their father, who knows how far back? So to attempt to try to figure out how do I change my mind is like chasing a dog in a parking lot. You'll never catch that dog because there's no way of knowing what the origin is. Where did that particular idea get put into the quantum soup that I call me? Consciousness is a mystery, but actually it's not so much of a mystery. Consciousness is a mystery like this concept we have of a creative force that we call God. It's a mystery because we say, well, it's out there. It's separate from us. And it sees everything. It knows everything. It's everywhere but you just can't describe it. You can't see it. And so we've always been led to believe that the creative force, the source of the seeing is something out there that we have no contact with. And so when we look at consciousness and we say, you know, that's the hard problem, that's the mystery. It then brings me back to what Anadi said in the, beginning of his talk about consciousness and meditation. The practice of meditation, when I first was introduced to it in 1971, I thought was about relaxation and so on and so forth. I came to realize that one of the primary discoveries that one makes through the process of meditating is to, that you discover that there's some aspect of our humanity that is continually noticing what's occurring in this thing called mind. There's something within us that is, I call it the final set of eyes. It's something that has no point of view. It's something that just notices. And it notices everything occurring in the external world, everything that's occurring within the somatic aspect of our being, the body. And it's something that is inseparably aware of what's occurring in this thing we call mind, which we have falsely been told is our mind. 
Oh, it's my mind. I don't mind it. And so we identify the mind as us. And then we identify the mind as the source of our seeing. But when the mind becomes the source of the seeing, then you see according to the conditioning of the mind. And so you get all these different points of view. Opinions. But opinions are not truth. Belief is not truth. Belief is virtual. Belief means the opposite of truth. To, for a glimpse of truth, an epiphany, a revelation to occur so that one has a direct experience that alters their humanity, perhaps permanently, that occurs when the seeing occurs from its source. And so seeing beyond 2020, And recognizing that we have to go from hindsight being 2020 to putting 2020 in our hindsight, that there is an experience that is occurring continually and an experience that is occurring as foresight that creates present sight to be clear. Because each of our cells is designed to detect and respond to single photons of light, it means that our entire humanity is designed to see without looking. It means that we are designed to see the formless before it is rendered into form. It means that the ability for awareness to precede experience is what allows us to meet each moment as it occurs and to experience the miracle called presence, presence. For me, it's about noticing that we are the noticers, not the thinkers. The part that is making choices is the part that is unclear. When clarity occurs, there is no choice necessary. It's only when clarity is not there that worry begins to occur, even though we call it thinking, in mm. an attempt to guarantee safety, security, and predictability, even though none of those things occur on this planet. There is an aspect that sees all there is. It's what um, I attempted to share in a multitude of experiences that occurred for me in the 90s, which created the content of the book, Wisdom from an Empty Mind, which is what occurs not from us, but through us in those instances of deep meditation, whether your eyes are closed or your eyes are open, that occur in those instances where for a moment, there's a glimpse through the eyes of God. There's something that is so profound that there's no way of explaining it. And so 
we're at a, a an intersection right now where we realize that whether you are seeking truth through a microscope, a telescope, gold standard, placebo controlled studies, or whether you are seeking truth through the direct experience of seeing clearly, not through the film of conditioning, those two aspects of truth seeking, whether through the eyes of the scientist or the eyes of the mystic are actually the same. They're all the same. And that is the most exciting place for me about the field of light and the field of color. And it's in that individual relationship with the different aspects of the light spectrum where magic emerges. Anadi mentioned the word resonance. Most of us know what that means scientifically, but we have ways we speak about this all the time that mean the same thing. Birds of a feather flock together because they're in resonance. People fall in love because they're in resonance. What occurs when this resonance is, is that unbeknownst to us while we're not looking, we slip from everyday reality into the source of the seeing. We disappear as individuals and become holographic focal points of light. We begin to emanate light. And when resonance occurs, everyday reality disappears. The aches and pains seem to disappear. The concerns about finances, relationships, or anything else in that instance are nowhere to be seen. It's almost like you got taken to a higher floor in a building and now you see something that you didn't see before and everything is instantaneously different. Resonance gives us the everyday experience of awakening for little instances. But those little instances are the most powerful instances of our life. And when we can begin falling in love with more of life, then the things that used to feel uncomfortable become more ordinary. The sources of stress, the cause or contributing factor to about 90% of disease, the source of the stress begins to dissipate and move into the background. We become less allergic to life and more in love with life. Mm -hmm. And so within the process of utilizing color, we can begin to reflect to ourselves the portions of the energetic spectrum, which is the foundation of what the material life comes from the energetic portion, the energy medicine, if you will. 
when we begin to experience our relationship with each of the portions of the light spectrum that we perceive as color, we begin to see right there what is easy to embrace and what is not so easy to embrace. And in the process of working with it gently and beautifully and deeply and aesthetically as Anadi does with his technology, it makes it easy for something within us to say, ah, oh, thank God I'm home, I'm safe. And from that place, something opens up and it literally allows the light to come in, to fill us up with light. It's in that crack where the light seeps through. And so when that opening occurs because we feel safe, that's when the clarity comes in, which is inseparable from the light. That's when we experience truth beyond opinion. And that's where we are transformed from using the light to seeing the light and then to recognizing that all of us are the light. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. Um, and uh, the one question that has come in previously uh, is how can we train our vision to create our future? And if there are other questions from the audience, uh, please feel free to send it directly to me on chat or, or to everyone on chat. Thank you. Training our vision is saying, um, I think I have something to teach to the source of life. For me, spending years in the field of vision training, what some people call vision exercises, doing all kinds of movements with the eyes, they were beneficial. As I began to incorporate aspects of mind, it expanded a bit more. But I realized the glimpses of clarity that people experience at moments where they're not trying to do anything. They just sort of come spontaneously. That occurs because the seeing retreats from the, from the eyes and the mind to the field of awareness, pure awareness that we call consciousness. Consciousness is not an individual phenomenon. It is a field, a background of all that is. It is the ocean from which each of our individualities emerge from. But when the drop falls into that ocean, all there is is consciousness. It's not my consciousness. It's not me. There's just something that is noticing. So how do we train vision? From my perspective, training has to do with doing. Doing is a concept we have that I think is actually antithetical to what's actually occurring because in this universe, everything is occurring effortlessly. The universe defines economy. 
An economy means your presence is all that is invested and everything comes back to you. And so the, the real aspect of uncovering vision are those instances where grace has occurred, something stops us in our tracks, the doing stops temporarily, the mind quiets temporarily, and all of a sudden, there's just a field of eyes that are seeing. That's when truth is experienced. And when that occurs, there's no need or there's no thought. There's no impetus for creating the future because in that moment, what's occurring is there's an aspect of seeing that sees everything that has yet not arrived. Right. The reason a bear wakes up the first day of winter when the snow has fallen overnight mm -hmm. and the bear meets winter with total presence rather than waking up and shivering and saying, oh my God, I for forgot to get my overcoat at Costco. Mm -hmm. The reason the bear meets life in each moment is because the change is necessary for that adjustment to occur in each moment has been going on for months. So what's coming up is noticed by ourselves well before it actually occurs in the external world. And our physiology is continually adjusting itself so that it meets life in each moment. When we begin to see those things, not as conceptual ideas, mm. but as actuality, mm. when there's a knowing, not a thought about it, then there's no need to make choices. One can live in a state of being choiceless. Master. Well, we have time for one more question. Um, there are many uh, that are here, but um, uh, we'll probably have to take that offline. But one question, which is a practical, or at least to me, it seems like a practical question. So how do we start the practice to actually see? Like, do we focus, meditate on something, or is it through some different way? How do we, how do we like get into this rhythm of actually seeing? Is there an overt way of doing it or is it just something that happens with time? You know, um, an old friend of mine used to say, it's good to have stepping stones, just don't take the stones with you. <laughs> We utilize practices because we're led to believe that there is a path, a stepping stones. Mm -hmm. And we go from one to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next, and then we arrive. But the state we're speaking about, there's no stepping stones to. Right. The awakening occurs as a quantum leap which essentially means you're in one state and then you're another and you have no idea how you got there. You speak about, is there something to do? One of the first things that Buddha said after his supposed awakening was, oh my God, there was nothing to do. So the doing, and everybody says, well, can you be more practical? Tell me what to do. <laughs> what to do is to notice how much doing you're doing. 
yeah. you realize that if you watch a baby, when a baby is hungry, it naturally eats. When it has to urinate, it naturally urinates. Its heart beats by itself. The breathing occurs by itself. The blood pressure regulates itself. The blood sugar regulates itself. Hormones release automatically. If something is touched that is warm, the hand pulls away. If something is needed, the hand goes out and grabs it. What I'm saying is very simple. Everything we think we have to do naturally occurs without doing anything. We receive guidance mm. to look in a certain direction because all living things have a purpose for being. And the, so there's something within the, uni the science of the universe that guides an apple tree to grow and create apples or a palm tree to create, um, uh, to create coconuts or a human being to develop. The tree doesn't have to do anything. It just is. The roadmap is already there. The roadmap for our existence is there. Before the scientist uh, says, oh, I had a great discovery today. If you speak to them, you'll find out that somewhere during the night a few months ago, they woke up because a vision came to them. It didn't come from them. It came to them and it pointed them to look in a certain direction. That's called inspiration. If we notice and are aware of what's happening in our life, we will see that our eyes are continually guiding us where we need to look at next. We don't need to look, we just need to allow seeing to occur. Mm. That occurs and is inspiring. When we try to do it, the inspiration is not there. The doing is the result of desperation. It's a, a lack. Uh, it's an inability to see that everything is occurring by itself. And so uh, this process um, is um, I think it's just the result of living. That in the process of living and experiencing all the different facets of the gemstone we call life, mm. we have moments of clarity. And then we have more moments of clarity and then more moments of clarity and and then those moments are guiding us. I'm not sure we ever arrive, right. but we keep seeing more and more and it becomes more exciting. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jacob. Unfortunately, because I could spend all afternoon discussing things with you, but um, that's all the time we have uh, today. Uh, if there are a few questions that remain unanswered, and for that, I apologize, we couldn't get to it. Uh, but um, uh, is it okay for them to contact you via email and ask sure. questions? Yeah. yeah, they can just email through the website at info at jacoblieberman.org. Dot org. So um, um, info at jacoblieberman.org. Org. Yeah. L I B E R M A N. Yeah. Uh, um, so, for those of you whose questions we couldn't get to, um, my personal apologies. We just ran out of time. And uh, Jacob, uh, thank you. I know you're really busy. Um, 
and I thank you for taking the time and thank you for everything that you have done for the ILA over the years as our vice council, as our guide, as our north light, if you would. And it's really, I feel very grateful and um, uh, thankful um, to all the forces that, uh, that we know you. Um, so um, thank you for coming. Can I say something? Sure, Jacob. Yeah, um, I thank you for thanking me, but I thank all of you yeah. because um, all of you are pioneers. All of you are looking at things that most people are not looking at. Mm -hmm. And all of you know that seeing things a little differently is both very exciting and very lonely at times. Yes. So to be able to, to connect with other people who are on the same page, on the same journey, it's what allows us to feel good about living. So I, I wanna thank all of you and um, uh, yeah, just thank you so much. Thank you. So it's a few quick, uh, one more minute, I know. We are far over our time limit, but uh, just quick housekeeping notes. Um, uh, please remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel and uh, please consider becoming a member of the ILA. It's only eight euros per month and you get access to resources that uh, uh, would impact uh, your professional practice, uh, your personal life in substantial ways. I know that it did for me. And uh, I hope uh, several of you would consider becoming members of the ILA. We would be back in two weeks, two Wednesday, same time, uh, 12 uh, noon Eastern time, New York time, uh, with two guests, Dr. Mark Ray of the Lighting Research Center and Dr. Larry Wallace, um, um, uh, who's going to uh, talk about uh, ocular phototherapy, as I mentioned earlier. That's going to be an exciting, exciting talk. Um, I want to thank uh, the talk show committee, which is uh, myself, uh, Abhay, uh, with Pascal Vidal in Paris, and Lynn Duell in uh, Australia. I believe she's in Adelaide. Um, I also want to thank um, um, our channel partners, uh, which is Color Gnostics, um, Soul Studio LLC, and Aqua Quinta. And uh, lastly, uh, uh, my thanks, thanks from the ILA to Justin Mench of AWA Agora and Anup Kushwa of uh, Soul Studio LLC. Um, that's all for today. Thank you, all of you for attending and for supporting us. And we hope to see you again. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Anadi. Namaste. Thank you.